Hello and welcome to the Training for Influence podcast, brought to you by me, Tammy Banks, Director of Tay Training and founder of the Training for Influence method. But it's not just me who you'll be hearing from. I'll be joined by a selection of our expert facilitators, as well as sector colleagues and fellow organisations, all in an effort to provide important learnings for key workers, people on the front line who are new, potentially inexperienced, volunteering, possibly agency workers, or perhaps returning to work previously retired professionals. This podcast is not a replacement for training. It aims to highlight important topics to act as an introductory resource for those delivering services under these unprecedented circumstances. We're covering safeguarding, managing challenging behaviour, risk management, professional boundaries, equality and diversity and the Mental Capacity Act. We asked our facilitators to select five top takeaways from a course they deliver. Takeaways the delegates have fed back that are really key or they as a facilitator think are fundamental to the session. In this episode we'll be speaking to TAE training facilitator Karen Warner about the top learnings from our risk assessment and management course. Welcome Karen. Hello. Thank you for being with us today we really appreciate your time. My pleasure Tammy. Would you mind just introducing yourself telling us a little bit about your history and why you deliver this course for us? My name's Karen Warner and for the past 30 years until 2018 I worked for North Yorkshire Police as a detective inspector where my primary role was around safeguarding and that's safeguarding children, adults, domestic abuse, child or sexual exploitation and as you can probably imagine within that there is an awful lot of risk assessment, risk management and working through what the consequences are should anything go wrong. So risk and risk management management are something that I have done quite a lot of in terms of the safeguarding arena. Fantastic it's clear you've got a lot of operational experience and we feel very fortunate to have you as one of Tay trainers. You've been with us a couple of years now and you take your experience within the police and deliver various courses for us and one of those is the risk assessment and management course. So today I've asked you to be a guest on the podcast specifically so you can pick out your five top learning points for people that are potentially new to working with those who have vulnerabilities or complex needs, possibly volunteering. How did you find picking out just five points from the course? Well, because I'm probably a very pragmatic person, I've tried to look at if I was coming into this brand new as a volunteer or somebody returning to the workplace to help out in the current climate, what do I need to structure in terms of my thoughts when I'm looking at risk? Because the minute anybody mentions risk or risk management or risk assessment, it tends to send people into panic and make them think it's really complicated when actually what I've tried to do is really bring it back to basics and make it as simple as possible for people to follow. I mean, clearly when when we run these courses, they are a day, they go into a lot greater depth and use a lot more examples. But I've I've approached it from a, what do I really need to know to keep myself, the organisation and the people I'm working with as safe as possible? Fantastic. That sounds absolutely perfect, Karen. So let's hear what they are. So I've actually got six, but but anyway. <laughs> of course you have. Yeah, you would know that, wouldn't you? <laughs> anyway, the principles I would want somebody to take away from this are a definition of risk, quite simply because if you Google risk, there are a number of definitions, but let's just pick and work with a simple definition of risk. And then once you know that, the second one is around how to identify that risk. But key, and I will keep repeating myself here, is also it's not just okay to identify a risk. You've really got to understand why it is a risk because that then informs everything else that you want to do. So then you need to assess the risk and also understand why you've assessed that risk. And what steps are you going to put in to manage, reduce or mitigate the risk? And for me, that's very much based on we can only ever eliminate risk if we never do anything. But in a sense, that could create an even bigger risk. So people need to understand and accept from the word go, we are never going to eliminate every risk to every single person, every single time. And then five and six, 
and I accept it's from a police background, but it's the documentation that keeps people safe because a risk and a risk assessment is only ever as good as the moment you write it. Everything changes, it's dynamic. Fifth and sixth points are around reviewing the risk, amending the risk, documenting the risk, and documenting not only why you've done something, but what else you considered and didn't do becomes equally as important as the actions that you actually take. Wow. So lots of really, really interesting points to cover there and lots of detail already just in that introduction as well. So it's going to be really interesting to pick some of that apart. Mm -hmm. And at the end of listening to this podcast, for people to be able to actually connect that back to what they're doing daily, because risk is apparent for all of us all of the time, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And for me, that's one of the learning points that I always find whenever um, I'm at a risk management session and I've been and observed yours and numerous other sessions that have been run for Tay training. I think one of the things that always comes across as powerful to me is watching the delegates actually connect what you're saying to their daily activities and particularly um, delegates who have never considered um, their activities to have any elements of risk and you you have a really good way of bringing it back to basics and having a look at those dynamic risk assessments as well. My simplest example that I use all the time and, and really because it gets people smiling but it just shows how simple risk assessment can be. Risk can be incredibly difficult, it can be incredibly complicated and very difficult to manage. I would always say to people, risk is an everyday occurrence for all of us. That's life. For every action that we take, there is a reaction and there are consequences. Some we do quite consciously, some we do subconsciously. My favourite example that I give, and it is to make people smile, but it does just bring it back to that very basic human element, is crossing the road. Now, I'm 54. Somewhere along the way as a child, I was taught how to cross the road be it the green cross code, be it look left, look right, look left again, be it stop, look and listen. And we all will have had a similar experience. So now when I go to cross the road, I don't stand there and think I need to risk assess this consciously and go through everything. It's just something I do. I stop, I look, I listen for traffic. Is it safe? Is there a car coming, but can I manage to run across? Is that a safe thing to do? And I cross over the road. And in a way, identifying a risk and managing a risk can be as simple as that yeah I think I think you're right there I think it's really important to break it down to the basics of the fact that we are all risk assessing all of the time and sometimes we don't actually realize it yeah that's right and also that understanding that if you go back to crossing the road the only way I can never eliminate that risk is if I never cross a road well That's not really realistic, is it? In usual life, it's certainly not. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That connects really nicely then to your first learning point, which is about the definition, isn't it? So bearing in mind kind of the example you just gave us with crossing the road and everyday risks, what would you say is the simplest definition of risk management? My very simple definition is a situation or an event that if it were to happen, could have a detrimental effect on a person, a community or an organisation, and that that detrimental effect could be quite significant. Because we're not just talking about risk to people here, we also always need to remember the risk to the organisation and a reputational risk to the organisation, and that the effects, should they happen, can be physical, emotional, financial, organisational, or as I've said, reputational. So go back to me crossing the road. I can't eliminate the fact that somebody could come along speeding that I didn't see. But if I look at what is the risk and what could happen, if I cross the road and something happens to me, the effects on me could be I could bump my knee, I could just be quite shocked, all the way through to something very serious and a life-changing and significant event in terms of losing limbs or having a head trauma. And that's what you've always got to bear in mind in terms of its simplicity, really. What is the risk? Is it going to happen? What's the consequences of that risk? And how likely is it? Fantastic. No, that's really helpful and really kind of clear steps of what to do to be able to understand whether it is a risk that's being presented to you. 
And sometimes you have to, and we all do, accept the risk and go with it and just put, as we will come to, the steps in place to try and reduce or mitigate that risk. That's great. Thank you, Karen. I now feel really clearly able to define risk. Your learning point number two, you said, was identification. What do you mean by that? Learning point number two, identifying the risk, is that situations and circumstances can change, which mean new risks come to to the forefront, if you like. And it's looking at from a professional point of view, whether you're a volunteer, whether you're paid staff, whether you're returning to the workplace, it's looking at what has changed from a situation last week where there was no risk to this week where as a professional, I believe or I perceive there to be a risk to a client or to my organisation. And some of that is around the information that you then are provided with. So we may have gone into lockdown, so therefore risks have changed. That information will come from my own professional knowledge and judgment. The information may come from the client. It may come from other agencies, either statutory or non-statutory, which means a risk that we hadn't thought about is now identified. Fantastic. So it's really important then, isn't it, that if we understand what risk is, that we then have the confidence and the skill to be able to identify it and use all of the different techniques that you've just talked about. And that's about having faith in your own recognition and decision making, but also really relying on other people and their skills and abilities to identify risk as well. That's right. And it may be that you receive a phone call from somebody that gives you some information that highlights the risk that wasn't there the day before. And when we talk about risk, are you talking about risk to you as a worker? Are you talking about risk to other people? Are you talking about somebody's risk to themselves? How are we contextualising it here? It's all of that dependent on the situation that you're working in. So For example, you could be somebody who goes into people's homes and cares for them, maybe prepares the meals, for example. Last month, there was no risk whatsoever. We're now in lockdown, we're now running with COVID, and the risks to your health and possibly the person you're visiting's health has now come to the forefront. So it's a different set of circumstances or a change in circumstances, which can mean a risk that wasn't there before is now a risk. That makes absolute sense. Brilliant. Thank you, Karen. So after you've identified the risk, what do you do next? What's your learning point number three? Learning point number three is around assessing the risk and looking at why we've assessed that risk as such. So you go back to all the information that you've gathered And you're looking at, is it a risk or isn't it a risk? Just because the circumstances have changed, does that make the risk to me, my client, an organisation any greater than before? But it's also looking at when you're assessing that risk, is it going to happen straight away? Is it going to happen in the longer term? So we even go back to the care worker example that we just briefly touched on. The risk might not be immediate because we're talking, say we're talking about them developing coronavirus and then passing it on to the person that they're caring for. The risk isn't immediate because we know the symptoms don't appear on day one and people don't get very poorly on day one. But seven days down the line, 14 days down the line, that risk becomes really apparent. So it's looking at the immediacy, but also looking at the longer term and then what you can put in place to manage or reduce that as well. And that's all part of that risk assessment. So learning point three is around assessing the risk. And for me, again, trying to keep it very simple because risk and risk assessment is quite a big subject is I know what the risk is, I've gathered that information, I know why it is a risk, and I'm assessing that risk in terms of when do I think it's going to happen, what's the consequences of it happening, and what can I put in place to reduce it. Fantastic. So you're explaining this in a really continuous way that is step by step. I'm quite a logical person. I like to understand what's happening next. And actually, if I understand what risk is first, then I identify the risk and then I assess the risk. That makes absolute sense. 
what do I do after I've assessed the risk? Because you've just gave some brilliant examples of how risk is changing all of the time for all of us. And at the moment, we're in circumstances which none of us foresaw. So if a risk has changed and I've just assessed that risk, what do I do next? What's your learning point number four? So learning point number four is very much around having understood there is a risk, having identified that risk, having looked at when that risk may occur and the severity of it. Learning point number four is really about what can I put in place to reduce or manage or mitigate that risk and why? Because key with all of this is documenting why you've done something. So just to go back to the very basic example we're looking of the care worker going into somebody's home. What steps can they take to reduce the risk? And that's not only to reduce their risk, but reduce the risk to the person that they're looking after as well. That might be wearing a mask. It might be wearing a gown. It might be washing your hands. It might be if you think you are unwell, not going anywhere near that house. So within that situation, there are various steps, various things you can do in order to mitigate or reduce the risk, whilst accepting that the only way you can totally eliminate that particular risk is never to go in that house until all this is over. Brilliant. That makes complete sense. Um, A really clear example there for us, Karen. Thank you. Now, you told us that you couldn't quite manage five learning points. So you've kind of done five and six, but they're interconnected with each other. Yes, five and six is kind of like you've done all your risk, you've done all that work. But actually, if nothing is ever written down, if you haven't put that in some kind of document, some kind of plan, some kind of written format, it means nothing in the future at all. So five and six is all about, you need to document what you've done. You need to document why you've done it. You need to document the things you may have thought of that you haven't done. And when are you going to review it? Notwithstanding that risk is dynamic and can change frequently. So it really is about actually making sure that you're recording what's happening and you're recording the process and your perspective and why you've made the decisions that you've made? Yes, while it's very clear that those decisions are made at that moment in time with the information that you currently have, hence why risk is always fluid, it's always changing and you need to be regularly reviewing that. Brilliant, that makes absolute sense. One of the things that as you've been talking about risk and explaining your thoughts and your learning points and what's key to you, I've been reflecting on some of the sessions that you've delivered for us. And as you said at the beginning, you go into a lot more detail and they're a lot more practical. And so, But something that you said on one of the sessions that I sat in on that really stuck with me and I'm just just been thinking about it now is the fact that actually sometimes this risk assessment process and the management of risk will take three minutes and other times it will take three weeks and that we're constantly assessing and managing risk and it's connected to actually what could the consequence be if we didn't assess and manage that risk at that point. Yes and and if I I suppose give a very quick and simple example just around domestic abuse just from if you like a a very ex-policey perspective so as a police officer you get called to a domestic abuse incident high risk and there's been physical abuse at that moment in time the risk is high the risk is high to the victim to the police and even the perpetrator and any children that may be in the house that's high risk You lock the offender up in the cells potentially overnight, straight away the risk to the victim is low because we have the offender in custody. Therefore, you've gone from high to low all within the space of 60 minutes, if you like. Then when it gets looked at in the morning and it gets investigated and we start working with other agencies, that risk will change dependent on what's going to happen with the offender. So is the offender going to be released, going to be charged? Will the victim go and stay somewhere else? So again, within 24 hours, that risk will have changed. Running alongside that, you're also then planning for the future and looking at what circumstances could change and what do you need to put in place to reduce that moving forward. 
you know that really kind of connects everything together for us and makes it really true to true to life as well because sometimes when we're talking about risk assessment when we're talking about risk management people do think well actually that's something other people do but actually it's something we all do all of the time and we all have a part to play within that and that I think that example just helped bring it to life a little bit for me as well. Yeah, and, and if you, you go back to the very beginning when I was trying to keep it simple about crossing the road, if I get that slightly wrong and a car narrowly misses hitting me, for example, I get to the other side of the road and I actually debrief myself. Again, this is not a really, I don't stand there and think, right, I'm now going to debrief my own risk because I've nearly been run over. But in my own mind, I might be thinking, oh gosh, that was a bit close. Next time I need to take a bit longer or that wasn't my fault. It was the driver's fall or I didn't see that one come in so straight away without even a conscious thought you're debriefing and reviewing and learning for next time so really we're all experts in assessing and mitigating risk in our own lives every day and it's just about actually having that understanding and connecting it to what we're doing professionally absolutely and for me just go back to the building blocks if you like What is the risk? Why is it a risk? When is it going to happen and how bad might it be? What are you going to do about it? And when are you going to review it? Absolutely. No, that's great. Thank you, Karen. And thank you so much for being the guest on our podcast today. I really appreciate your time and appreciate you picking out your five slash six key learning points. Is there anything you'd like to say to the listeners before we end this podcast? All I would say to anybody is not to be frightened of risk and not to make it so complicated that it almost paralyzes you into doing nothing. Brilliant. That's a fantastic message to finish on. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Tammy. Thanks so much for listening today. We hope it's been time well spent. I'd like to finish by saying a huge thank you. Whether you're working or volunteering on the front line with vulnerable and or complex people, a manager supporting a team, or part of the cogs that keep the wheels of a frontline organisation turning, truly, thank you. It's only together that we can help people stay safe and prevent harm and abuse. Please don't forget about yourself though. No one, no matter how amazing, can pour from an empty cup. There is a reason emotional resilience features in all our courses, irrelevant of the subject. It's because it matters. You matter. Take care of yourself. If you'd like to know more about me, Tammy Banks, Tay Training, or the Training for Influence methodology, please have a read of the show notes. You can also find us on all social media platforms at Tay Training, or contact me directly via email, tammy at taytraining.org.uk. If you hadn't noticed already, I love to talk. Have a good day.